I took a picture of him here because I know him. So. And my dad, yeah, I went home and like, well, I see the dog and all the stories and stuff on him. So I'm like, so I'm more ready to get it. And so we moved to my certain two years and took us from our house to um, Southwest, Southwest to Richmond, yeah. Richmond to yeah. the yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, we'll get started, and uh, you can open your Bibles, of course, to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, believe it or not, I think I'm breaking some of my own records, I mean, here we are, we already had four lessons, and we're not on verse 5, we're on chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I, you know, you think about the good old days, but the good old days had their bad times too. I think of uh, uh, a professor at Columbia University in the 50s. He wrote this, he said, there is no reason to suppose that a man's life has any more meaning than the life of the humblest insect that crawls from one annihilation to another. What a hopeless view of human life. I mean, really, you know, what a meaningless view. And actually, when you think about it, that's pretty much the way Solomon, in the first couple chapters, has been explaining the, the life of humanity under the sun with a perspective that doesn't involve God, that doesn't bring God into the picture. But we know, we know that human beings are created in the image of God. Uh, we know that insects have life cycles. Human beings, though there is an example, if you're looking at life strictly from under the sun, you could say humans have life cycles. But we know, as we saw, that God's view is not cyclical, it's lineal, and human beings do not have life cycles, they have, in reality, histories. And of course, what I just said is right there, what we've been talking about. Paul told the Ephesians that if you're a believer, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That word workmanship literally means you're his poetic masterpiece. You are his specifically designed spiritual snowflake, if you will. And, and I know that doesn't sound tough, you know, for a guy, but the, the point is, is that snowflakes are all individually different as God has taken the time to create them differently, he has taken the time to create human beings differently as well. However, if we are not unique as human beings, like the Bible says, and if we really are not that important at all as to be specifically designed by God, 
then yes, that would be a true statement. We are nothing more than insects, just higher evolved insects, if you will. And if we aren't important, then it's true. Life has no meaning. And if life has no meaning, then it's true. Life is not worth living. But again, that's the desperate look of life under the sun. Now, for the first two chapters, that's exactly what Solomon has. That's the case he's been presenting. He is saying, look, I, here I am, the wisest person. I'm the king. I'm the one with all the resources. And I'm telling you that life is meaningless. Life has no meaning. Life, why? Why not, Solomon? Because it's monotonous. I mean, nothing changes. There's nothing new under the sun. And do you know what? Wisdom doesn't handle it either. That's empty. I tried to use all my logic and all my wisdom, the wisest person ever, and when it comes strictly to under the sun, it's futility, as is my wealth as well. And he said, you know, I had fun. I, I pleased myself. I did whatever I desired, but in the long run, to put it in my, our own words, you're only going to find emptiness in self-indulgent pleasure. And then we saw that your death is certain. I mean, that's about as depressing as you can get, but under the sun, your death is certain and all that wisdom of mine is not gonna matter. It's not gonna matter. I mean, even though, okay, I'll admit to it, Solomon says, Wisdom is better than folly, not godly wisdom. We're not talking about Proverbs type godly wisdom. We're talking about common sense versus no common sense. And as been said, common sense is not very common anymore. But here you have the person who lives without any boundaries and the person who at least handles his finances wisely, takes care of his body wisely yes from an under the sun perspective that's better but he says the bottom line is this we're both going to end up in the same place now is that a theological statement no that's an under the sun statement theo meaning god is totally left out of the picture so from the perspective if you go through life without God entering into the picture, yes. It doesn't matter how wise you are or how stupid. That's what the word actually means in the Hebrew or how stupid you are. It doesn't matter because you're both going to end up in the same place, six feet underground. And then he points out what's even worse than that. After I'm gone, no one's going to remember me. Oh, they might for a little while. And he, even when you look at Solomon and his greatness, all that he was, unless you're a student of the Bible, ask the average person, they don't know who Solomon was. He's some kind of Bible guy, maybe. Um, but other than that, no. Maybe he's a rock group or something like that. They have no idea. Well, then he goes on to say, you know what? Because of that, I hated life. I hated life. He says it was, it, it disgusted me, is the picture. And so wisdom's not going to matter, and his wealth's not going to matter either. Here's why. After I die, I can't keep it. I can't take it with me. No matter how much, uh, uh, and you know, the, the Egyptian pharaohs, that's why they had all those riches there. They thought, had the idea they could take all that stuff with them to the kingdom of the dead. But you can't. You can't keep it. You can't take it with you. And you can't protect it either. He says, you know, all I can think about is who's going to get all my stuff. It could be one of these people who's an idiot and he's just going to lose it, he's going to wreck it, or my wife could marry someone who's going to just trash it all and gamble it away or something like that. I can't protect it either. 
And because I'm spending all my time worrying about it, I lose joy. I can't even get any enjoyment out of it because I keep worrying what's going to happen to all this stuff after I die. Well, the bottom line is this. Solomon then brings God into the picture in a positive manner. He mentioned God in chapter 1, verse 13, but he was whining about the fact that God has given us this grievous task to try and find meaning in this world. But in verse 24, we saw last week that you have to recognize life as God's gift. That's the only way you're going to understand anything like meaning and enjoy it in his will. Yes, and, and he, what he's going to do now is he's going to back up a bit and go back over these four statements that he made. And he's going to examine them in greater detail. Starting with time. this time that we could have together. Thank you for your word, how brutally honest it is. It doesn't paint any pretend pictures. It, <clears throat> it tells life how it is, and we thank you that you are way over that. You are not constricted by uh, the, uh, the troubles and the confusion that's here on earth. You're not up in heaven wringing your hands, wondering what's happening and where's it going to go you're a god in control and we thank you for that in jesus name we pray amen so again solomon is going to begin with the monotony of life he's going to approach it in greater detail so we look at the question is life monotonous after all and verse 1, I don't think a lot of people realize how profound verse 1 is. We look at this passage, and I know you're familiar with this passage. Uh, if you were a baby boomer like me, you remember the bird song, Turn, Turn, Turn. And these are the lyrics right here. And so we often focus on verses 2 through 8. But verses 2 through 8 don't make sense unless you understand verse 1. And what verse 1 is telling you this, if you want a picture, is life monotonous? You have to look up and understand God orders your time. God orders your time. Look at verse 1. There is an appointed time for something. Is that what it says? There is an appointed time for what? 
everything. And there is a time for every event under heaven, under the sun. There's a time for it. And as a matter of fact, an appointed time. This is an incredible verse on the sovereignty of God. And I want you to stop and think. If you believe verse 1, think about all the anxiety that can remove from your life. Think about all the worry that can take away from your life. If you realize there is an appointed time for everything. Now, I want to rehash something we learned already and give you a new perspective. Go back to chapter 1. You remember when we looked at how Solomon started out this journal. And in chapter 1, look at verse 2 once again. Vanity, and you remember what that means. Emptiness, futility, right? The inside of a soap bubble when it bursts, cotton candy. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Emptiness of emptiness, it's all empty. What advantage does man have in all his work? which he does under the sun. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also, the sun rises and the sun sets, and hasting to its place, it rises there again, blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. And that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, hey, look, see this? It's new. No, already it has existed for ages, which were before us, and there's no remembrance of the early thing, earlier thing. Now, when we looked at that, Solomon's intention was to show us how weary life is, how monotonous life is. However, when you put God into the picture and you filter chapters uh, everything we just read in chapter 1, filter that now through chapter 3, verse 1. And you know what you come up with? Not monotony. You come up with God's consistency. You come up with God's faithfulness. We can, why is it? We can, when we get the calculations right, um, astronauts can send something in the orbit and have it return, unlike the Chinese, have it return exactly where you want it to return. How is it we can do that? Because of the consistency of the planets and God's nature and his constant control. Why is it that we can even set clocks <laughs> And the sun rises when we predict and the sun goes down. Because not a, you can look at it one way and say, monotonous. The sun's going down, the sun's coming up. It's going to happen every day. Oh, woe is me. I'm stuck in a rut. No. We can look at it and see the wonderful consistency and faithfulness of God. And we can see how dependable God is. You see, when you think about it this way, from before your birth until after your death, until your death and after, God is accomplishing his divine purpose. So you've seen this described not as history, right? But you've seen it described basically as his story. And that's the difference. You are part, and I, I'm not trying to give you a, uh, 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 what do they call it? Uh, this is not a motivational speech. When I say you are part of his story, that's just a blessing that's right there in scripture. 
You are part of his plan and part of his story. So that's how you filter all your circumstances when you go through this thing called life. And the question is, we may not, the point is, we may not understand all that he is doing around us. And we may not understand why he is allowing all these things to happen around us. The real question is to us, as we saw in Romans 13, not questioning God, you're not doing this right, what in the world are you doing? No, the point is, how do we react to it? Do we trust his sovereignty? Do we trust chapter three, verse one? Do we trust how much he loves us? Remember the statement that believers, true believers, we don't live by God's explanations. We live by his promises, see? And so let's look at this passage, well-known passage, chapter three, verse one, again. There is an appointed time for everything, and it, there is a time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now these 14 statements, they, uh, statements that, um, these are events, this is what we have to understand about these events. These are events that come from God and there's an appointed time for them. And if we understand his sovereign control, then that's how you understand, or it helps you understand life. That's how you understand how, skip down to verse 11, God can make everything appropriate in its time. Or if you have a King James, it says, God makes everything Anybody have the King James? Beautiful. Beautiful in its time. And so you may get frustrated. Um, sometimes we do. But understand, when we get frustrated with God's plan, or angry about God's plan, or anxious over God's plan, then our perspective, your perspective is clearly under the sun. That's when we have to get it up above, the, as we talked about last week, up above those clouds, and as the pilot takes you up out of those clouds into the clear blue sky, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> you know, otherwise, you're going to end up like chapter 2, verse 14, saying, along with Solomon, I hate my life. I hate my life. Well, just a couple technical uh, observations here. This, um, this idea of these um, polar opposites that you see here, scholars suggest totality when you see that. Like when we say, hey, from east to west, north to south, we're saying the whole geography, right? The whole map. And that's basically the idea of totality. Also, there's seven pairs. And when you see the number seven, very often, many scholars, and I'm not into, you can really carry that numerology thing uh, to its ridiculous extreme. But it's pretty obvious, at least I think in scripture, that when you see the number seven, it's usually a Hebrew concept for completeness. And if you doubt me, go get some Hebrew national hot dogs. Good hot dogs, but there's only seven in the packet. And you end up with what we call in our family the superfluous bun. 
the hot dogs are good. And if you want to write to them and say, listen, why do you not have eight hot dogs? Their packet says what? It says we answer to a higher authority. <clears throat> anyway, that was for free. So the first one he, he hits us with in verse 2, <clears throat> something we're all going to deal with, and that is life and death the bookends of your existence on the planet. I won't say the bookends of your existence because there's, you know, there's e eternity. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. But as far as this world is concerned, God is in control here. And uh, our children were born what we called premature. One of them was very dangerously premature, but we took, we had to take, um, uh, I can't think of the word, um, <clears throat> we, we had to take satisfaction in the concept that they were premature from our perspective, but from God's perspective, they were born right on time. And that's why the psalmist writes, all the days ordained for me were written in your book. But there's also a time for planting and plucking, if you will. You know, there's, and understand in all of these points, all of these pair, there are different, you know, there's slightly various um, um, uh, uh, explanations as to what they are. Not everyone agrees. Some people go into big theological things about them. I think the whole point is in verse 1. You don't have to get uh, nailed so down, so far down, as to um, uh, debate what exactly they're standing for. I think if we just take it for what it says, just read it for what it says without getting deep and symbolic or anything like that. You always run into problems when that happens. But um, let's turn to Psalm 65. And as you can see in your handout, I've, I've got you uh, marching around the Psalms a bit, around the Old Testament a bit. But <clears throat> there's a time for planting and plucking. Now you know that in the Jewish culture where Jesus um, lived, and where even earlier, you know, when, when Solomon is writing to these people in this whole area, as we saw in our first message, agriculture is what their life is about. And for the Jewish people, as a matter of fact, agriculture is what determined their religious year, if you will. But we know that farmers sow seed but it's God who gives the increase, right? Well, you're in Psalm uh, 65, and um, look at Psalm 65, pick it up in verse 9. You, God, okay, you visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare their grain. For thus you prepare the earth, you water its furrows abundantly, you settle its ridges, you soften it with showers, you bless its growth, you have crowned the year with your bounty, you and your paths drip with fatness, the pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing, the meadows are clothed with flocks and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy, yes, they sing, recognizing that all has come from God. You know, farming is such a great illustration of uh, the whole quality, the whole miracle of faith. Because when you think about it, <clears throat> especially back then, before technology was used, but even, even farmers today with all their technology, are still at the mercy of the weather. 
And so a farmer puts everything, think about this, a farmer puts everything he has into the ground, and then what does he do? He waits. <laughs> he waits. You can, you can do a certain amount of irrigation and fertilizing and so on and so forth, but you know, you pray for rain, basically, and everything you've done, you've put into the ground. What a great example of faith. And you know, a farmer has to cooperate with God also. Because the farmer in the Midwest can't say, you know what, I, I don't like this idea of planting in the spring and harvesting in the fall. That's not going to work out for me. i got a couple vacations planned and so on and so forth. And so I, what would work out better for me is to plant in December and harvest in March. Okay, that's my plan. Well, guess what? Your plan isn't going to work out too good in the Chicago area, in Illinois, is it? No. So it's very obvious that um, you've got to cooperate with the spiritual laws of God as well. Otherwise, expect disaster. But there's also a time of killing and a time of healing. People, Christians, don't like to talk about this reality. But yes, there's a time to kill. If killing has to be done. In Romans 13, Paul makes a point of saying, the Roman soldier doesn't carry his sword for nothing. He's got it for a reason. He might have to use it. It's not a decoration. A police officer carries a sidearm for a reason. It's not for decoration. It's for a reason, and he might have to use it. Turn to Luke chapter 22. I think you might be surprised at something. Now, let me just, let me just tell you that people have tried, they, they have tap danced around uh, this whole passage and, and I'm just going to take it for as simple as it is without reading into it. And I'm telling you ahead of time, yes, there are many ways people interpret this. But I, I think it's as simple as just reading it. In Luke 22, Jesus says this in verse 36. But now, whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Now in verse 38, they say, look, look, here are two swords. We've got two. What does Jesus say? No, beat your swords into plowshares. Is that what he says? He says, that's enough. That's all you need. Okay. We don't need to have everyone carry a sidearm. All you need is Two. Now, you can tap dance around that and you can say it means something else, and many people do, but I just take it as simple as it is right there. There's nothing wrong with protecting yourself. And the thing about protecting yourself, you better realize you might have to use it. But on the other hand, the government, it's very clear in the scripture, I believe anyway. The government has a responsibility for capital punishment as well. And we can debate that, we can argue that, and, and, and many Christian people do debate that and argue that. But the purpose is not so much punishing the person. Scripture, you know, in the Old Testament talks about justice and the whole idea of someone who takes a life loses their life. The, the point there is not punishment so much because if you really wanted to punish them, you'd torture them for their whole life. That's punishment. The purpose is you take a life, you lose your life, is so that others will fear. That's the idea. But you see, there is a, and, and when you look at times when Israel disobeyed, when God said, you know what, I want you to wipe these people out. I want you to annihilate these people. 
And when they had a, when Israel thought they had a better idea, rather than wiping them out, well, we'll, you know, we won't be so hard on them, so on and so forth. They suffered for generations, didn't they? So that, that's a hard one to swallow, but I think this might be a little easier to swallow when, when you look at um, uh, World War II and um, the destruction of the atomic bomb. The whole lot, I mean, here is, here is a war that, um, <clears throat> that we had lost. Every, every family in America was affected by this war. And the horizon didn't look good because the next step was to invade mainland Japan. And that was a guarantee of losing just an incalculable amount of lives. So when the atomic bomb was dropped, it was a way of in, in there, and you can, you can talk about the morality of it or whatever, but the reality is it saved millions of lives. However, after that, what did we do? We poured, and you don't hear a lot about this, we poured millions of dollars into Japan trying to get them back up on their feet with technology and help and compassion and so on and so forth. And I see that as, yeah, there's a time for killing, but there's also a time for healing as well. There's a time for tearing down and a time for building up. I guess you could say Solomon was into urban renewal. And I, I you know, one particular time we were um, in Southern Illinois and we were driving to this um, farm to uh, go goose hunting. And I remember this picturesque, the image is still in my mind, of this old abandoned farmhouse with the grass growing around it. And the sun was coming up, shining through the parted boards. This farmhouse had to be 150 years old. and. Immediately I stopped and I thought, I wonder what it was like when they were building that house. I wonder what family lived there. I wonder what family walked on those floors. I, I wonder what the country was like. Who was president? What, what were their cons everyday concerns? I, I just think about that stuff sometimes. But you know, there's a time, all that's gone, that's history. There's a time to tear it down and a time to build back up. We used to hike across from Bremen, Midlothian Meadows, before they put all the trails in. And we would come across every now and then these old stone foundations. Um, I know it's rumored that during the Civil War there was a munitions factory out there. And you just wonder, I mean, here were people working and living and there was some kind of structure up there well there's a time when it gets torn down and god's appointed time there's a time for weeping and a time for laughing and though a christian is to rejoice always right uh, that's in philippians rejoice always again i say rejoice does that mean you can't cry no we grieve Paul told the Thessalonians, not as the world grieves. No, Christians grieve with hope. You can still have that inner joy that's based on a relationship and not be happy, not be thrilled about what happens. That's happiness, but you can still have joy. There is always for the Christian family, there's the joy at least, I mean, I'm feeling my grief right now, but at least I have the joy that they're in the presence with the Lord right now. Well, there's a time to cry. And as a matter of fact, God appoints a time to cry. So when there's a time to cry, go ahead and cry. But remember, when there's a time to laugh, don't act like you're baptized in lemon juice. You know, there's a time to laugh as well. There's also a time for mourning and the time for dancing. It's appointed. Turn to Psalm 149. 
Psalm 149. <clears throat> There's a time for mourning, but notice a time for mourning, not a lifetime of mourning. A time for mourning, because continued grief under the sun just creates bitterness. I, I had a neighbor who lost her husband, and um, we were having a chat over the fence after the fact, and I got on to talk about spiritual things, and very bitter, and she was, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this life is hell. This is hell right now, right here. Well, she has since died, and I can guarantee you she doesn't think that now. You see, when we have an eternal perspective and trust God and live by his promises, not his explanations, then like David, you can say, thou hast turned my mourning. Well, let's take a look at it. You have turned, and this is not the passage I ask you to turn to. You're in Psalm 149. But David said, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth. You know, the whole idea of dressing up in a sackcloth as your mourning. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Why? That my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You know, let me, let me just stop and say a thing about dancing. I know that's an issue that some of us have grown up with. If you grew up in the church too. Dancing, like many good things that God has given us, has been sinfully corrupted by the world. You know, let's look at some of those things. Take music, for instance. Music can be a beautiful thing. It's very obvious God has designed us in a way that enjoys music and responds to the beauty of music. But there is also, and I don't know what it is, I can't, I, I can't delineate where the line is but we also know that when Moses came down from the mountain and they had this massive orgy going on, Moses said something about the, I heard the noise of their music. Something about it was not musical. It was noise to him. Now, I can't say what that is. I don't know where the line is. That's where the debate and the argument is, right? However, it's very clear that music can be used in a corruptible way. Or take the written, and, and you know, I mean, I would hold my grandkids and sing to them, and they would, I mean, here they are, they can barely open their eyes, they would break into a smile. You know, a little grin. Now, you say, that's gas, Len. Well, you know, I don't know, I'm just, at least to me, they're responding to my music. Um, on the other hand, you know, you ever notice a, a, a little kid when they start to sit up and music plays, you don't have to teach them to do this. They just start doing it. God has designed us to enjoy it. But like everything in the world, it can become a bad thing. God uh, has given us the written language. I, you know, we take that for granted, but the writ written language is a miraculous, wonderful thing that and I used to explain to the kids at school. Think about this. All you're looking at is ink on a piece of paper. But if you can comprehend and understand that, the thought that's in my head, I can look at that ink on a piece of paper and you can have the same thought in your head. You know that when the missionaries approached um, the American Indians, that freaked them out. They thought it was magic. When they would whisper something in somebody's ear and write it on paper, and then the other person knew it, that freaked them out. Because they didn't have written language 
the same way we do. However, we know written language can be used to tear people to pieces. It can be used to spread lies. It can be used for pornography. God's given us medicine. And medicine, I, I'm here alive as a testimony to uh, the gift of medicine that God has given us all. But we know that there's issues with drug addiction, very plain and simple. Food. God has designed us in such a way to appreciate. I mean, we could be, I was watching a thing on cicadas as a turtle just was a floating cicada and the turtle just on. Oh. I'm sure he doesn't sit and enjoy the taste of a cicada. Maybe he does. But I know for sure God has designed us in a certain way to actually enjoy food, not just as a means of sustenance to stay alive, but actually to experience enjoyment. However, we also know you can eat yourself to death. The physical relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, I point out and say, I don't have to get into any details how we live in a very twisted, perverted world that, that they're trying to even push on our kids in school. And so with all that to say, add to that dancing in the Bible. Dancing in the Bible was not sensual. It was not meant to be suggestive. I mean, when it, when it was suggestive, it was pointed out as such. And it was not to draw attention to oneself. It was a way of worship, joyfully praising God with your body whirling with joy, if you will. And remember, this is a pair, these paired opposites is the joyful dancing with what? Mourning. It's the opposite of mourning. And so God appoints a time for mourning, but he also appoints, appoints a time, look at Psalm 149. Praise the Lord, exclamation point. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king, and let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. It's about joy. It's not about, hey, look at me. It's not about, hey, this is, this is sensual, I want to attract you this way. It's about praising God. So, yes, God appoints. He has an appointed time for the most traumatic things that cause mourning, for the most joyful things that cause dancing in the Lord. But God also appoints the most mundane, everyday things, like throwing away stones, and gathering stuff. This is another one of those verses that some people say it's it's about throwing stones at people or about your enemy throwing stones into your field that you're cultivating into your garden. It's definitely not talking about kidney stones. That, by the way, comes later in chapter 12 uh, when he talks about old people especially, but um, no. It's talking about the fact that Israel was filled with rocks. They had a saying that an angel was carrying an armload of rocks, tripped, and spilled them all over Israel. And if you can imagine, all of those rocks would be a real nuisance for a farmer. Have you ever, in Chicago, have you ever shoveled your sidewalk you know, pushing the shovel like this and then hit a crack and you get that jolt, your whole body gets jolted. Well, imagine the farmer in Israel, here he is, he's trying to um, plow his, his, his garden, his field, and boom, you hit another one of these rocks. And the idea is you have to dig it out and toss it to the side. However, God's sovereignty, I believe, is even in the most mundane things like that. 
God appointed, and I, I, I really believe that God appointed every one of those aggravating rocks for a reason. You say, wait a minute, Len, you are, and, and you can take that literally or figuratively, the rocks of life, if you will. But you know, maybe you're thinking, Len, you know, I think you're going too far to see God's hand in everything. Well, wait a minute. If Jesus, if, or if, if Scripture says that the hairs on your head are counted, that's pretty mundane, all right? I mean, that's pretty detailed. So I don't see why he hasn't appointed every one of those aggravating rocks in your garden as well, especially when going back to our text, verse 1 says there is an appointed time for what? Everything. Verse, and for every purpose under heaven. For every event under heaven. But on the other hand, think about this. You see, these same stones that were aggravated and you discarded in frustration later, you're going to need to build a fence. You're going to need those rocks to build your house. You're going to need those rocks, heaven forbid, to build a fortification or an embattlement. So the same stones that may be a monumental nuisance to the farmer, are to the builder the perfect cornerstone. As interestingly enough, we saw in 1 Peter, Christ is the perfect cornerstone. And Christ, on the other hand, to unbelievers, is a stumbling stone, a stone of offense. But there's also a time for embracing and not embracing. <laughs> And nothing is more encouraging and comforting than getting a warm embrace from a sincere person. And sometimes we are moved to give someone a, a, a loving, warm embrace. But you know, on the other hand, sometimes there's a God appoint, appointed time to um, not lovingly embrace them. But sometimes we have to lovingly confront a sinning brother or sister. Um, some people, just some different interpretations, some people look at this couplet as uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife. Sometimes there's a time for embracing, as 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, where your body's not your own unless you're given to prayer and fasting. Um, other people say it has to do with the Mideastern custom of embracing when you greet someone and then there's a time to let them go. Either way, it's a God-appointed time and a time for getting and a time for losing. Some translations say a time for searching and a time for giving up as lost. And with that translation, I, I can't help but think of, you know, uh, every uh, tragedy where um, somebody uh, drowns in a lake or they're missing for that time. And, and uh, you know, there's a time when the searching just has to stop and you have to give up as lost. Um, on the other hand, it could mean a time for getting things and a time for losing things. We learned early in our marriage, we learned a lot about things. We didn't have a lot of things. We poured all of our resources into a house and all we had in the house was a borrowed nasty couch, a borrowed chair, my antique barber chair, a little black and white TV set about that big. And um, we had a, uh, a mattress and a metal frame. And um, for our wedding, they were still in boxes. We got some beautiful china. Now, no one wants china. You can't even give it away. But we had this beautiful china. And when I got my first addendum check for coaching, we bought a china cabinet. And when Colleen was putting the china away, she didn't have that back 
plate in the groove correctly and it slid like this and two pieces went and boom, boom, dented our new china cabinet and crashed and broke to the ground. We learned about things that same week when I was at Bremen, we were doing the play Stalag 17 and I had a big trunk of my uncle's uh, relics that he brought from the Battle of the Bulge in World War II and two German helmets that were perfect for the play because they still had the Luftwaffe insignia on the side. So it was perfect for the play. And I, shortening the story, I had assigned one of the students to collect all the props. Here's the lock, here's the key. Well, he missed the helmet somehow and it turned up missing. Well, all that to say is we, we, we were forced to learn that there's a time to get the stuff and a time that's out of your control to lose the stuff because it's just stuff. As we saw last week, Job lost everything. He lost all of his stuff, his money, his kids, his health, and he ends up worshiping God as we saw. Well, there's a time for keeping and a time for throwing away. As I pointed out last week, America has 90% of the world's storage units. There's a time to get rid of the stuff. There's a time to garage sale. There's a time that keeping it serves no purpose. Guys, those gym shoes that have served you so wonderfully, yeah, there's a time to get rid of the faithful ones. The old t-shirt with, with the uh, yellow stains in the armpits, you know, it served you faithfully, but there's a time to get rid of it. There's a time for tearing and a time for mending. Um, without, you know, some people say it deals with relationships and things like that. I think if, if we just stick to what it says and we think about the, uh, the Jewish people, um, they, of course, had the practice of tearing their garments when they were in great distress. There's a time to tear them apart. There's a time to sew them together. And we wish we could all be good at this, but there's a time to keep silent and a time to speak. We just can't always tell which is the right one till after the fact. But there's a God-appointed time to just keep our mouths shut, a time when love covers a multitude of sins. There's a time when we don't need to say, I told you so, or add that extra little thing, you know, that, well, you always do that. You always say that. There's a time to be quiet about it. But on the other hand, there's a time when you don't, do not cast pearls before swine, right? There's a time when, some, when you might have to confront somebody. A time when you do need to speak boldly. Jesus spoke boldly before the Pharisees. Stephen spoke boldly. Um, Peter, he was told, you need to stop preaching. He said, all right, I'll leave it up to you, though. Who do I obey? You or do I obey God? There's a time to keep talking, regardless. Paul... He said, pray for me. He didn't say, pray for me because, you know, these shackles are really rubbing against my skin um, and, and I'm in a lot of pain. Pray for me that I get out of this place. He said, pray that I have more boldness. There's a time for loving and a time for hating. And um, we don't have time to go to these passages, but sometimes... There's a time for us to hate what God hates. And God tells us that he hates six things, no, seven. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. Sometimes, yes, there's a time to hate. There's certainly a time to love. I, we don't have to spend lots of time talking about uh, showing the 
the love of Jesus, and then there's a time for making war and a time of peace. And so when, when you are in the appointed time for peace, that's a gift from, job, from God. Enjoy it. But on the other hand, peace at all cost? No, not necessarily. Truth at all cost. Justice at all cost. And so there's a time for peace, but a time for war as well. You know, God has used war many times to bring about spiritual revival. Well, finally, I want you to look at our verse once again, verse 1. You are not, you are not as the writer of Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes began. You're not a ball in a pinball machine. Helplessly bouncing around, bing, ba, bing, 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 bing. That's not you, all right? No, you are right here in verse 1. As you go through life, understand there is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. And you have the assurance of verse 11 that he has made everything beautiful in its time. There's Romans 8, 28, right there in the Old Testament. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we can have together. We trust you. We trust your sovereignty. We, we trust your love for us. We trust the fact that you will right all wrongs eventually, but that that will happen in your time. Not according to our plan, but according to your plan. And so we trust you with that. Lord, I pray that we would live as your children. Help us, Lord, when we doubt. Help us when uh, we uh, get distracted by everything that happens in the world. And may we look back and remember you are a sovereign God in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Have a good week.